If you would open up your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. Last week, Ted um, decided to focus on husbands, and he uh, appointed me to talk to the women today. <clears throat> I really want to talk about angels, but, you know, just kidding. <laughs> Another time. Um, all right, so we are going to tackle a verse. How many of you all, well, those of you who know me, know that I um, find great joy in tackling very difficult verses and unraveling things that um, religion has twisted up and uh, caused people to either not want to uh, read or, you know, just, you know how the, what religion does. Um, but... I've always really, really loved this verse. And so I'm going to take some time today and unravel things for us today. That way we can receive all of the grace that God has for us through his word. Okay? Because we don't want any kind of religion to blind our eyes from receiving all that God has for us. All right. So if you turn to, I can't talk and turn at the same time. Actually, I don't need to turn it in my Bible because it's right here. All right, 1 Peter 3, 1 through 10. Um, let's begin in verse 1. Wives, <laughs> in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. When they see the purity and reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Husbands, in the same way, be considered as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as a weaker partner and as heirs with you as a great, of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. So the title of this message, Ted's message last week, and this one is Unhindered Prayers. So what hinders prayers? So Ted talked about the fact that, you know, when we're doing life with one another, when we're, you know, butting heads maybe, sometimes our prayers, it's hard for us to pray, right? But I want to take it, which I totally agree with, but it's true, right? Sometimes we have to just hit pause and, and you know, just going to the throne room of grace and asking for help in your time of need, that alone will just settle us down and help us resolve conflict. But I want to take it just one step further here because I don't know if y'all remember a couple of weeks ago, I spoke a message about prayer, right? And I talked about um, how it is, um, you know, the way we pray, effective prayer, praying in a way that gets answered. So what causes us to have prayers that don't get answered, that are unhindered? Well, the number one reason is religion. It's pride, Right? Because God resists the proud and give great, but gives grace to the humble. Right? Grace flows through hearts that understand the love of God and the grace of God. Before Paul, so this letter was written by Peter, but Paul also, the apostles, spoke a lot um, in, to marriages, to, to husbands and wives. I want us to look at this slide up here. This right here would represent Paul and how he would have prayed before he had a revelation of the grace of God. Paul was um, a Pharisee. He had been raised as a Pharisee. And in the um, Torah, actually it was the Talmud, which was added in later, it was all these extra laws that were added in later, this was one of the prayers that the men would have prayed before grace. So Paul before, blessed art thou, O Lord, our God and King, who has not made me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. That right there was, is what we would call pride. Those kinds of prayers don't get answered and should not be answered because that is laced with religion and pride. Okay, A, a man who is submitted to the grace of God and understands grace 
Now his prayers look like this. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. You see the difference? So what hinders prayer? Pride. So pr grace flows from God to one another. And what Peter, what Paul was talking to, what he was wanting us to understand was that when we understand the grace of God, it should flow in our relationships because that's how grace flows. He wanted us to walk in love. He wanted us to have a heart of understanding and respect for one another, okay? So just like um, husbands are told respect their wives, right? Likewise, women should respect their husbands, just as men are to love their wives. Wives are to love their husbands. It's a mutual love for one another, okay? So that is um, what, I just wanted to focus on that just for a little bit before I really get into the heart of my message. Really quick, just a quick quote, quote that I read from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis said that humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Okay, so if we want to understand what humility is, it's not that we're peons and worthless. That's not what humility is. It is about thinking of yourself less and considering other people better than yourself. And that is what Paul often talked about. So before I really get into the heart of this particular passage, I'm going to take a step back and go um, a little bit further, actually a lot further, because we have to start at the beginning. Um, recently, I was looking at our website analytics, and I was curious to see what causes people to stumble across our website. And you can look to see what um, keywords that people will type in, which leads them to our website. And the number one um, Google um, question that people typed in that led them to us was, about generational curses. That's the number one thing that people search for, which I happen to write a blog post about, which led them to my blog post. The second highest thing that people searched for are, are women allowed to preach? <laughs> which means that there is a massive vacuum among, among the church on addressing this issue, massive. Now, I'm going to go back and I'm going to address some things that have been so misconstrued throughout the centuries. And I'm going to show you why and how that has been so misconstrued. We're going to set it to right and then we're going to go from there. Okay? So we have to start at the beginning. We have to start at the beginning. And at the very beginning in Genesis, the very first chapter of Genesis, chapter one, it says, and God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void. And the darkness covered over the face of the deep. And the Holy Spirit hovered over the deep. And then, then it says that um, God spoke, light be, or let there be light. Right there, we have a triune God working together to create the world. Right there, in the beginning, God. God is Elohim, and Elohim always refers to the triune God, the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit working together. Whenever you see anything in scripture where there is a voice that is spoken, when God speaks, that is Jesus speaking. Because John, like John says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus is the word. So whenever you see light be, God said, that is Jesus declaring the will of God. God the Father is the heart, is the will for mankind and for the world. Jesus is the one who speaks it and the Holy Spirit is the one who moves. The Holy Spirit moved, brooded over the surface of the deep. Whenever you see uh, the brooding, the, the, uh, the 
fire, whenever you see anything that uh, means wind or water, that is all the Holy Spirit at work and moving in scripture. And so you see that God, the triune God, created mankind. He created man first. And man was formed in his image. They were formed in the image of God. And God breathed his very breath into the nostrils of Adam and he came to life. It said that he breathed into his spirit. His spirit came alive. He came alive with Zoe life, the life of God. Let's pause there for just a second. In our English translations in our Bible, all of our translations would um, translate God and pronouns for God in masculine, in he, right? He, God. However, in the Hebrew language, it's very much like the Spanish language. In the Spanish language, you have gender specific pronouns and you have gender neutral pronouns, correct? La pelota, that, that is feminine. El vaso, that's masculine. And then you have gender neutral words, all right? In the Hebrew language, they have the same thing. What's interesting to note is that in the Hebrew translation, anytime the Holy Spirit is mentioned as a pronoun, it is always mentioned in a gender, gender neutral way. Now, the Holy Spirit, let's, let's talk about the Holy Spirit for a little bit. Let's look at a couple of um, names that the Holy Spirit is uh, how the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the Bible. The Holy Spirit is mentioned as our paraclete, paracletos, which is our comforter. Jesus described the Holy Spirit as our comforter. He would leave the comforter after he left. Um, also, ezer. Ezer means helper, right? In fact, 21 times in scripture, God is referred to as ezer, God our help. Have you ever heard of the name Ebenezer? That's what Ebenezer means. God is my help. Easer, help. The Holy Spirit is described as tender, gentle, sensitive, can be easily grieved, is powerful. Now, if we just pause for a minute, we can see that there is a lot of feminine characteristics about the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit is a female, okay? Let's just make that clear. But I am saying that the Holy Spirit is described with very feminine characteristics, which is not a far-fetched idea, considering that man and woman were created in the image of God, which means God has to have some feminine characteristics. Has to, right? So that is not a far-fetched thought and idea. Now, Let's go back to male and female made in the image of God. Why did God create male and female? He created them, God said, so that they would have dominion over all the creatures. All right? God created mankind so that they could co-reign and co-rule with him on this earth. They would be his, uh, the ones that um, had dominion. God created the earth heavens are his the bible says the earth he has given to mankind and he has given mankind authority over the earth that is why he created mankind so the first thing that we have to understand about male and female both together is that they had a shared commissioning and shared destiny they had joint leadership. They were supposed to work together as a team. They were to be fruitful. They were supposed to multiply um, the fruit of the earth. They were supposed to take dominion over it. Number two, they had shared origin. Both, both shared origin with God and with each other, both male and female. Now, this is an important thing to take note of. God created Adam, male, from the dust, Y'all know that, right? He, he took the dust and he formed Adam out of the dust. Female was created out of Adam's side, right? God put Adam to sleep and he created Eve out of a rib from Adam's side. Two parts of one whole. 
And that is an important note because had Eve been formed out of another kind of dirt, then maybe the church fathers and all of the Greek philosophers who came up with the way of believing that has been you know, passed down for generation would have some weight in that women were less than men. Now, let me just read to you where that thought came from. That actually stems from the belief system that women were less than men stems all the way, not only from the beginning of the time, but since we had written history. The Greeks, who were the founding thinkers, the ones that, in fact, a lot of our Western belief system that we have here today were formulated because of the Greeks. Because when the Greeks, Plato and, you know, all of these Greek philosophers were around, their thinking um, was used as textbooks in the Western civilization. So a lot of the belief system of the Western culture comes from the Greeks, the, you know, all the Greek philosophers of the back in the day. Um, and there's a word that, that's called Hellenization. They Hellenized the world. So what they did is they, um, when they gained power, they took their belief systems and they spread it across the world. And that was the intent. Okay, Homer. <clears throat> Homer, who wrote the Iliad. Anybody ever heard of the Odyssey and, and, and uh, Iliad? The Iliad? You probably read it in school. So Homer, he was the most influential author. Um, he... In his work, Zeus, who was the god, um, you know, the god of gods among their pagan, you know, belief system, he abused his wife. And I'm not even tell you how he abused his wife, but he said this about women. Everything, for there is no faith in women. Hesiod said this, women are a deadly race of guile and evil, a shameless mind and a deceitful nature. Aristotle said women are a monstrosity and a deformed male. How do you like that one? Aristotle said women, oh, I already told you about that. Um, he said the male is by nature superior to the woman and the woman inferior. The male is a ruler and the female is a subject. The Romans were no better. The Romans had its beginning when they came and plundered a group of people called the uh, Sabines. They killed all of the men in that town. They kidnapped the women. They raped the women. And that is how the Roman culture was developed. In fact, to this day, even from that time period, one of the repeated things that they would do from that point on whenever there was a marriage ceremony is the women would wear a veil over their head as a sign of um, grieving and the men would throw the women over their shoulder and take them over the threshold in order to declare that victory that happened and that's still carried into our marriage traditions today. I don't want to ruin your marriage or anything, but, <laughs> you know... <clears throat> A lot of, you know, things that we look at today, we don't realize actually had roots in something. <laughs> Romulus, who was the founder of Rome, uh, told the men that they had permission to decide which one of their children lived or died. Now, among the church, throughout church history, it is believed that women were weaker and a lot of that thinking stems from the very verse that I just read to you. Because in that verse, it says to treat your wives like a weaker vessel, right? Or a weaker partner. But actually, what that word um, means, and King James Version calls it a weaker vessel. But if we actually do a study of the word vessel in scripture, that word vessel is always used to refer to something precious. In fact, when you look at Revelation, you see that, um, that God gave instructions about certain vessels of ivory and precious wood and vessels made of stone. There were vessels in the tabernacle that were to be cared for and to be, you know, there's, there's so much symbolism when it comes to vessels. And vessels, according to, in, to God's estimation, were, were a thing to be cared for. They were rich. They were precious. You see? It was the equivalent of, you know, if you had fine china, basically, how would you treat fine china? With care. You wouldn't hang it around, right? You would treat it with care. 
That is what that word vessel means. It gives a whole different definition as to a woman being weaker. Now, the church has also taught that because women were created second, it makes men superior and gives him authority over woman. Logically, if you follow that train of thought, the stars and the animals would have authority over men because they were created before men. So you can't follow that line of thought. The third thing is they um, had a shared name, shared name. In Genesis 5, 1 through 2, it says, Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. So they actually had a shared name. God created, um, when he created Adam and Eve both together, he named both of them Adam, which means mankind. Now, when God created Eve, he said, I will make a helper suitable for Adam. And what Ted, so how Ted so beautifully put it last week, God did not create Eve because Adam was lacking anything. He had everything that he needed in the garden. He had all of the God love and relationship that he could ever need, except that he didn't have anybody to pour it into. And so God created Eve to come alongside him so that Adam can pour his love into her. That is what the reasoning of of God creating a partner, a matching pair for Adam was about. He said, a helper suitable. And then at that point, Adam said that she shall be called Ishash, which, which means feminine. That's what Adam called her. He called her feminine or wife. Now, that word helper is the word ezer. Ezer. Do you remember what I just read to you about the Holy Spirit? He created an ezer and he created her as suitable. That word suitable is the word neged, which means match, equals, and partner. That's what that word means. So, in other words, an Ezer Neged is a partner, one who stands alongside, helps us, and fights alongside of us. Now, the fourth thing, they had this a shared tragedy, shared tragedy, shared fall. When the serpent came to Eve and he deceived her, it's interesting. Because if you go back to Genesis chapter 2 and you read what God had instructed about the trees in the garden, God was very specific. It tells us that there was one tree in the middle of the garden, right? And that, middle, that tree in the middle of the garden was the tree of life. That's the one that was in the midst of the garden. Midst means middle. God said... Out of all of the trees, including the tree of life, you may freely eat. The only tree that you are not to eat from is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was the only tree that they were not allowed to eat from. And the Bible does not tell us where that tree was placed. What's interesting is when the serpent came on the scene and he talked to Eve, he said to Eve, did God really say you couldn't eat from any of the trees of the garden? You see what happened? Right there, he told her that God was stingy and that God was withholding from her. That's not what God said. However, when God gave those instructions, Eve had not been created yet. Adam received the instruction. He was responsible for telling Eve what tree they were supposed to eat from. And not only that, he was right by her side. That means he didn't stop her. That means that he was responsible for telling Eve whether she was supposed to eat from that tree or not. Now, that changes a few things, doesn't it? That means 
the scripture verse that a lot of people like to have used to tell women that they're the ones who are easily deceived and shouldn't preach, such as 1 Timothy 2.14, and Adam was not the one deceived, it was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner, holds no weight as far as women being the ones who are easily deceived and can't handle the word of God. Doesn't it? And by the way, I was actually thinking about this last night. And I was like, you know what? You know how it is that when, ladies, when our husbands like spend time with a buddy and then when they come home and you're like, hey, how did your meal go? And they're like, fine. And you're like, well, okay, how's his wife? I don't know. How are the children? I don't know. What did y'all talk about? Just stuff. And then you're just like, well, hold on. Like, what kind of stuff? Like, surely you talked about their life and how they're doing and how the wife is. Like, I want to know. And they're like, I don't know. We didn't talk about any of that stuff. Do you know what I'm talking about? I was like, that was a before the fall problem. That's troubling. <laughs> Only the ladies know what exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, all right. Anyway, going back, <laughs> reeling in. All right, so in other words, out of all of the years of women being blamed for the fall, we can't say that. Let's just go back for a little bit and just go back to one of our founding church fathers, one of the, the founding theologians that influenced like John Calvin and you know some of these other guys. This is what he had to say about women. He said, women, you are the devil's gateway. You were the first deserter. You destroyed God's image. Man, on account of your desert, even the son of man had to die. That was our chap. Founding church father said that. And that has bled into church history. It is time that that comes to an end. That has to come to, that needs to go. Now, just one other side note. The fact that Eve was deceived, and I'm not saying that Eve had no responsibility. She had responsibility. In fact, when God came to them in the garden and he, he knew where they were, they were the ones hiding from God. All of a sudden, the lens of who God was got distorted. The God who walked with them, who loved them, who made them, who wanted to pour out his grace and his forgiveness all of a sudden, their lenses got skewed about the truth of who God was. They're the ones. In fact, when God went and looked for them and he was ready to receive them, Eve blamed his wife. Eve took responsibility. She said, yeah, I was deceived. And because of that, they had to face the consequences because now they handed over the keys of dominion to the serpent who brought in all of the wickedness and evil, disease and sickness. That is how we became a fallen world. And the consequences of the fall were, I mean, it is, it, we're still living in the con consequences of the fall today. So it's not that Eve didn't have responsibility, but let's get the story right. One of the things that the church has also said about what happened in the garden was that Adam and Eve rebelled against God. They willingly rebelled against God. And yet that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that they were deceived. Eve was deceived. And that is why Paul always talks about guarding our hearts, guarding our minds from the deception of the enemy because he comes in and he twists lies so subtly that all of a sudden God no longer looks good. So if we're living in our lives in a way and viewing God in a way that God no longer looks good, there is a deception that we have believed that the enemy has planted in our hearts. It's deception. And ultimately, who is it that God held responsible? Adam. God held Adam responsible through one man's disobedience. Adam, that's what Paul talks about. Just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam. Corinthians, death came through a man. And so Adam, in, in Adam all died. All right. Lastly, actually two more, 
they had shared consequences. And here's the kicker, y'all. Here's the kicker. And here's what we have to deal with as Christians. Part of the consequences to the fall, now keep in mind, the serpent was cursed, the earth was cursed. Adam and Eve were not cursed. They were given the consequences as to the fall. The consequences was that to Eve, that her desire would be for her husband and that desire does not mean that you're gonna want him. That word desire means you're going to want to devour him like a beast. That's what that word means. You're gonna want to conquer him. That's what that means. And you can see that all throughout history, isn't it? We get very warped perception. Every culture, every single culture has been a war of the sexes. It has been a war of women against men. Men devaluing women, women fighting, conquering, subjecting men. That is not what God wanted. That is not our design. Men, his desire would be to exercise dominion over women. After the fall, Adam, he became Adam. And he, immediately after, Adam named his wife Eve. And there you see two different individuals separating and becoming two individual people. He named her Eve, which means the mother of all living. What's interesting to note about the fact that Adam was the one who named his wife Eve was that he redefined her. The IVP Bible background says this about Adam renaming his wife. He said, this was a demonstration of his authority. In the ancient world, when one king placed a vassal or a lesser king on the throne, a new name would often be given to demonstrate the overlord's dominion. Lastly, they had a shared hope. God did not leave them helpless. In fact, while they were, before they were driven from the garden, keep in mind, it was important that they leave the garden because if they ate from the tree of life in that state, they would have lived in that state forever. So it was God's mercy that they leave. All right, and I'm gonna, we're gonna redeem all that here in a minute. But while the, um, they were in the garden, God performed the very first sacrifice. He killed an animal and took the skins and covered over their shame. God did that. And that is a picture of the gospel. Jesus is the one who laid down his life and it is his blood that covers over our shame, not just covers it. He became your shame and he traded places with you and gave you his righteousness. He covered over their shame. And the most beautiful thing of all is even before the fall, the triune God had orchestrated a plan to redeem mankind. Ephesians says that we were predestined to be in him before the foundation of the world. And the fa that word foundation is a word that, that refers to something violent that happened. That means before the fall, Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. You know who was lost? You were lost, we were lost, and he came in our lostness, and he came and redeemed us, and he brought us back into himself. The consequences of the fall was that they lost truth about who God was and they lost the truth about themselves. They lost trust. They lost true identity. They lost innocence and their state of glory. They lost their security. They lost respect for one another. They lost humility for one another. They believed God was angry with them and opposed to them. They adopted orphan thinking that women were inferior to men. Men would desire to dominate. Women would try to destroy men and they would battle against one another. But God, but God, Jesus' death restored our value. And Jesus did not die for junk. And Jesus did not die for something broken. Jesus died for his great treasure. And for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, not despising his shame. It's shame. That means you were the joy set before him. He endured the cross to redeem you and restore the value that was lost in the garden. 
You were the joy set before him. That means his death was your death. His burial was your burial. His resurrection was your resurrection. He did not leave you to die in your state of shame. He died to resurrect you to new life. That means you have the power to love one another the way that you were intended to love one another. We have the power to do life with one another. We have the power to come alongside our partners and and to encourage them when they're down. It is no longer 50-50. It is 100%. 100%. That is what we are called to as biblical women. What you find through Jesus, keep in mind, ever since the garden, a woman's voice was silent. No longer did you hear from Eve. Every so often you saw these little glimpses of women. When Jesus came, he restored their dignity. He met with a broken woman at a well, the first woman to become the evangelist. Not just the first woman, the first person to become an evangelist. She ended up, her name is Fotini, and she ended up living a remarkable life and later went on to become a martyr, was thrown down a well, and she was killed as a martyr for her faith. Jesus stopped for a woman on his way to hell, from his way from hell. When his body was broken, when he was in the grave, his spirit was alive. And then on his way to heaven, he stopped for a woman. A woman. Jesus restored our dignity. Jesus restored our value. He restored what was broken in the garden. Women, you are not less than. You are not weaker. You are not second class, second rate citizens. You are worthy because Christ has made you worthy. Paul, here are some of Paul's workers. You want to know some of the women that Paul worked with? We have Judea and Synthyche. They were the pastors of the Philippian churches. They were the chief pastors. Paul called Junia in Romans 16, 7, a super apostle. She was outstanding among the apostles and he spent time in prison with her. And you only spent time in prison for your outspoken declaration of the gospel. He named Priscilla first, always before her husband, which was a sign of honor and respect because of her position as a leader in the church. And she's the one who instructed Apollos in his ability to preach and declare the gospel. And it says that Apollos was a better orator than Paul was. In fact, historians, half of the historians over biblical history, they credit Priscilla as a writer of Hebrews. Now, wouldn't that be scandalous if that was actually proven? In this letter to wives, Peter was addressing the Jewish scattered church. And that's important to note. It's always important to understand who the author was writing to, okay? He was writing to the Jewish scattered church. Now, a few things. That's, can we bring up the main scripture verse up here? Before I, I close this up here, bef- uh, I'm halfway through, y'all. Um, before I close this up and, and just give you an understanding of this scripture verse, there are three main things that I want to clarify for you. All right, now I'm not going to go back and read it, but you can see some underlined words. The first one is the word submit. How many of y'all like the, the sound of that? Submit. It's actually a very beautiful word. Let me just define that for you. Actually, that word is defined, the Greek word for it is uh, hypotasso. Hypotasso is the Greek word for the word submit. And that word is a military term. It means to arrange, like troop divisions, to arrange in a military fashion under the command of a leader. In a non-military use, it was a voluntary attitude of giving in, cooperating, assuming responsibility, carrying a burden, and responding to one another's needs for the good and the vision of the whole. That's what that word means. Now, keep in mind that when Paul wrote to the Ephesian church and he repeated this phrase, wives, submit to your husbands. Right before that, he says, submit one to another. So it's a mutual submission. Now, 
Let's talk about the way submission was used in scripture. Jesus submitted to his parents. There is a submission to authority, submitting ourselves to the word of God. The church is submitted to Christ. It's used 40 times in scripture to uh, describe the conduct of Christians, the conduct of those suffering for Christ, the conduct of elders and the conduct of young men. Submission is voluntary and its purpose is to reflect Christ. Voluntary yielding one's preference to another for the overall good. Do, you, do we understand that word now? Is that clear now? There is a picture of when I was uh, studying this, actually I studied this a couple years ago. There's a picture that uh, was given by a theologian to describe what this looked like in a military sense. Back in the Roman days, um, what, uh, what would happen is when they were at war in the Roman days, they ca carried shields. Now, whenever they were in a battle or whenever they were um, needing to come together, and they were having to march forward, if there was one soldier that was out of line and his shield wasn't like locked in, they were told to submit. That's what that word means. It's to come in to guard for the overall good. So that should redefine that word for us and give us a better, clear understanding. Now, what it does is it doesn't it, like remove the responsibility of that word. It raises it to a whole nother level, doesn't it? It, it brings all of us to another level. The, the second thing that I wanted to highlight is there's a, in verse three, it says, your beauty should not come from outward adornment such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Now, I wanna highlight this because there have been entire denominations that were, were developed because of this verse. You know, there are denominations that have said that women can't wear pants and women have to wear their hair in buns and not wear makeup because of this verse. And that is not true. Now, let me help you understand. In 1 Timothy, going back to this verse that I had brought up, when Paul was addressing the Ephesian church through Timothy, he said this. Now, for those of you who are new, who don't know this verse, because I've taught on this before, hang, hang with me, okay? I'm gonna explain it. Um, he said this, I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, uh, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Okay, really quick. Let me, let me see if I can just do this as fast as possible. Paul was writing to an Ephesian church. In this Ephesian church, most of the people there had come from a pagan background and their patron goddess was the goddess Artemis, who was the goddess of childbearing. In their um, culture, what they believed, this goddess Artemis, and the Roman name for Artemis was Diana. What they believed is that there was a female God and this female God was the one who created this earth. And it was a female who helped birth her, her brother. And so she's credited as the goddess of childbearing and those who worshiped her were saved in childbirth, all right? And the way that we knew that the, the priestesses of the house of Artemis was by the way that they dressed. They were dressed in certain clothing. There were certain levels in the Artemis temple. There was the level of the prostitutes who were known for their shaved heads. Then there was the next level of priestesses. And these priestesses were responsible for um, rehearsing and telling the creation story of this goddess. And they were known for their braided hair with gold and the way that they dressed. And the last tier was like the, the top tier. These were the women teachers and scholars of this goddess is Artemis. What was happening in this culture, in this church, is these women were coming to Christ, they were coming into the church, and the way that the Greek orators went about you know, uh, arguing is they did that. 
fought, they argued. So they would come into a public scene just like this and they would raise their voices and argue amongst each other. The women were coming in and they were teaching their creation story that it was a female God who created the world. Now, when Paul was addressing this church, he was saying to them, get the story right. It wasn't a female God, it was a male God. Adam, a man, was created first, then Eve. And you will not be saved by worshiping Artemis, you will be saved by God. God is the one who will save you. And you will be, not be known by the way that you dress, you will be known by your spirit a gentle and a quiet spirit who knows your God, who believes your God, who trusts your God. No longer are we part of this world who worship gods and goddesses. We are now children of the living God who worship God alone. That is what Paul was saying. And so when he was telling the women, uh, this, the, uh, Peter was addressing the, the scattered Jews who were living among pagans, they were being heavily influenced by the pagan culture. And so the way that they were dressing was moving away from the way that, that reflected a heart that trusts God. And they were now starting to look like the people around them. And they were starting to dress in a way that reflected idolatrous worship. That's what Paul was addressing. And finally, one more little hindrance to us understanding this verse. And it is a fact that Sarah called her husband Lord. <laughs> no, we are not going to start calling y'all lords. <laughs> Let me explain that because that has an explanation. <laughs> All right. Now, very briefly. In the story, the narrative in the Old Testament, God called a man by the name of Abraham, actually his name was Abram, and Sarai. He called them out from among his people and he was going to make a people group out of them. He wanted to bless the nations of the world through Abraham and Abram before his name was changed. Abram um, was changed from Abram to Abraham. Sarai was changed from Sarai to Sarah and both names were changed to reflect that they were the mother and the father of many nations. Now, when the word of God, when God himself first visited Abraham, the very first time, he came and visited him a few times, but the very first time you will find in Genesis 15, and God shows up and meets with Abraham, and he takes Abraham outside, and he points to the stars, and he shows him all of the constellations in the star, and he shows him the gospel. He declared the gospel to Abraham through the stars. And it says, God promises him that he would be his shield and his exceedingly great reward. That is the promise that God gave Abraham. And right then is when God credited righteousness to Abraham. The promise was not that he would have a child. That's not when Abraham first believed. Abraham first believed God when God said, I will be your shield and your exceedingly great reward. When he was declaring the gospel to him, he was declaring Jesus. He showed him Jesus. He showed him the gospel and Abraham believed the gospel and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham did not believe and didn't, did not, um, he didn't behave rightly even after that. There was a time where he sold his wife. He said that she was her, his sister, which was a half truth. And she got sold into Pharaoh's house. And then later on, he did it again in fear. He had fear over the people groups and he was sold into the house. She was sold into the house of Abimelech. And thank God, God's the one who stopped it. But here's so what's so beautiful about this. Sarai, Sarah, she was not the one standing outside with her husband meeting with God. And yet God credited her the righteousness that he credited her husband. She was included in it. She was included in the promise. And not only that, God did not rehearse her mistakes. He did not remind us. Never again does God remind us of Abraham or Sarah's mistake. He only goes back to the point that they believed. And what is amazing is even after her husband lived in fear and he sold his own wife away, 
to the gods of the land, Sarah did not call Abraham a fool. Sarah called him Lord, which was a pet name that we use today. It's like a name that I would say to my husband, hey babe. It was a term of endearment. It was a term of respect. And the important thing to note is that she did not bash her husband. She did not call him out. She did not call him a fool. Even when he was in fear, And so, this should bring us into a new depth of understanding and revelation over this verse. Let's go back and let's read this again. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. When they see the purity and reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not not give way to fear. When we do life with each other, Ted talked to husbands last week. Women, I'm going to talk to you today. Oftentimes, we are doing life with people who forget the word. They may fear. They may get into fear. They may do something rash or stupid. They may spend money thinking that they were going to you know, start a new business and it fails. They may not be leading you spiritually the way that you would love to be led spiritually. They may watch too much TV or play too much video games or whatever the case may be that irks you and gets on your nerves. But here's the thing. When we get into fear, it wreaks havoc. Fear is a precursor to speaking badly about our spouses. It brings death because it's flesh-based. It's based on our fear, the fact that we are afraid that, you know, we, 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 predict, we predict something about their behavior for the future and we're afraid of how it's gonna affect us. Isn't that why we get into fear about our children? We predict negative things. If we see that our children are misbehaving, we can get into fear and we can say, oh no, they're going to X, Y, Z. If our kids are not walking with the Lord right now and they've been bought into this world, the lies of this world, fear can cause us to predict a bad outcome for them. Fear causes us to fight against one another, to dominate over one another. But here's the important thing. When Christ died on the cross, his side was split, just like Adam. And we were brought into him. He brought us into his heart. That means our bodies are no longer our own. They belong to God. We are not individual people anymore. We are in him, living our lives individually. We have our own individual personality, but we are in him, reflecting the love of God. We are in an overflow of the love of God to one another. And so when our husbands, it doesn't just say women who are married to unbelievers, although that would qualify. It says if your husbands are not believing the word, when our husbands are, are causing us to be tempted to fear, the right response is to say seated. You are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Can you declare and can you predict and declare good over them? Can we do that in the midst of times when we're in fear? I'll just give you one little example and then we'll close this up. Years ago, I have a lot of stories, but I decided to taper it down. (laughs) Um, Years ago, when we were youth pastors, 
we went through a very, very scary time. Actually, we weren't youth pastors at the time. We were, I think we were already executive. Ted was an executive pastor. And the Lord had birthed in our hearts a desire to plant a church. And it was like one of those dreams that we kept thinking, are we going to have to bury this dream? Are we going to have to just let this dream go? Because it was year after year after year after year. And then something happened, which it looked like it was never going to happen, that we were going to have to just release that dream altogether forever. And I remember I was worried. I was in fear. But I also noticed that my husband was in fear. And I realized, I remember sitting at the kitchen table one morning, and I recognized that I was not predicting the blessing. I was not predicting and I was not holding on to the thing that God had already deposited in our hearts concerning our future. And I took a moment and I got my heart back into alignment and I realized, no, God has called us to this. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit came in and he gave me a prophetic picture about our future. And in this prophetic picture, he showed me that we will be launched into ministry. But right now, it is time to launch somebody else into ministry. And while I was waiting in this season, when my heart was in a place of rest and peace and looking towards the good of the person that God wanted us to launch into ministry, that is when everything changed for us. And I was able to tell my husband, God is with us and he is not against us. What God has declared will come to be. I was able to be the one to, to realign and refocus. If both of you are in fear, it wreaks havoc. Sometimes one of us has to be the one to rally the troops. Now, lastly, I want to pray for anybody in here who, particularly the women, who may struggle oftentimes with fear in their marriage. Fear that causes us to predict bad outcomes. Um, there's a quote from uh, Charles Spurgeon that I always held on to with my kids. And in this quote, he said, um, uh, don't prophesy um, defeat, prophesy victory. Prophesy victory. Don't ever go into defeat. Always prophesy victory in your lives. So I want to pray for women who may struggle with fear in their marriage because fear causes us to manipulate and be passive aggressive. It causes, it wreaks havoc in our marriage and that is not a healthy marriage, okay? Second of all, I'm going to pray for anybody who may have experienced the pain of a, of a spouse not loving you. We have a lot of women and unfortunately the way that it goes as far as divorce and husbands leaving. It, unfortunately, it's more men who leave than women who leave. And so we have a lot of women who've experienced the pain of abu and abuse um, in marriage. You may have experienced divorce or a husband leaving you. And um, I just really felt the heartbeat of the Father as I was preparing this for you. And I want to pray for you because... And there's something I feel like is prophetic that the Lord wants to do. And I really feel like the Lord wants to use our men here to um, bring a level of healing to you. Um, and so I just want to invite you um, up to the front if, if you want. If not, just stay in your place. Maybe raise your hand so we know to pray for you. And if you're a man in here, I... I want to encourage you to go bless that woman because there's something healing that happens when a woman is blessed by a man. And it's like he can stand, take the place of somebody who should have loved you well. And it'll heal a part of your heart that the Lord wants to heal today. So can we do that? Let's just all stand together. Again, come on up if you need prayer. Come on up. There we go. 
Okay, awesome. Keep coming, ladies. Keep coming. If there's anybody who's just experienced any kind of pain and trauma in your life, because specifically because of men, can we come on up? And um, that's an open invitation. Awesome. All right. Those of you who are our prophetic men, come on up. And let's just bless these beautiful women who've come up. We're going to hear the heartbeat of the Father over them. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And I also hear one more thing. Women who've experienced the pain of abuse, either you have been devalued, your bodies have been devalued, you've experienced any kind of rape or abuse or sexual assault also. And I know that's very sensitive and you don't have to come up for that because that's a very sensitive topic. But I just really believe that the Lord is gonna do something as you sit, unless you wanna come up, you can come up if you want to. But if you don't, the Lord's gonna touch you right where you are. And I just really believe that the heart of the comforter is going to touch your heart right now. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are in our midst. The heart of the Father who has been grieved over his daughters. Grieved that his daughters have not been loved the way that they should have been loved. Have not been cherished the way you have cherished them. That they have been wounded at the hands of those who didn't understand who they were. Father, I thank you for our men, the men of this house. Lord, I thank you that these are sons of God. These are sons of God who are operating under the ministry of reconciliation. They are men who love you, Father. They are men who are submitted to your heartbeat. And I thank you that you are using our men to bring healing to the women who have not been loved well. So right now, I just thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are touching and moving and healing hearts. That all of those wounds right now are just being wrapped up in the Father. That he is taking that brokenness and he is making it whole that all of the pain and the trauma of the past right now has been undone. It is undone. And Jesus has become your peace. Jesus has become your comfort. He has become the one who has taken your pain and he is giving you peace. He is giving you healing. He is restoring what has been lost and what the locust has eaten. He is returning to you a thousandfold. No longer does the enemy have a voice in your life. No longer does he have a, any kind of say in your life. You are free. And he who, the, he who the sun sets free is free indeed. Holy Spirit, you are our comforter. You are our peace. You are the one who makes things right. And we receive it, Lord. Lord.